Hi, this is Professor Rogers. This is a video on the one-way ANOVA in SPSS. This is a stopgap video. Um, we just recently got everyone in the university on SPSS, so we want to take advantage of more of the features than we had in the previous video. And also we have to bring in the notion of effect size, which is in the most recent version of SPSS that we have. So I call it stopgap because we don't have all of the materials developed that uh, we put together that go with the video. But we'll still be running links out uh, to the website. Uh, so with the video and the other materials, you can get everything figured out. So ANOVA in this case means analysis of variance. And you'll notice there I capitalize the letters that are used to create the word ANOVA. It is a bivariate statistic. We use it when we have one numeric variable and one categorical variable with two or more categories. It's different from a t-test in that with a t-test we can only have two only have two categories, but with the ANOVA we can have more. It is a form of the general linear model. I'm not going to go over all of the aspects of the general linear model. I have a separate video on that, and, and so my recommendation is if you're not familiar with the general linear model, or GLM for short, that you go back and take a look at that video first before you view this one. For our example, we are going to look at state-level crime rates. Uh, you see the crime rates here in the mean column. Uh, that is the natural log of the violent crime rate. Natural, natural log was taken because crime rates are skewed to the right. If you saw the video on the independent samples t-test, uh, there the question was, are crime rates higher in the South than they are in other parts of the country? And that was set up as a two category variable. So you were either in the South or uh, you were in one of the other regions and all the other regions were combined in the same category. Now what we're going to do is look at the same question, only we're going to have each region now assigned to uh, its own category. The test we'll use for this is the one-way ANOVA, uh, and we find it in SPSS. We go to the analysis uh, area up, up in the top bar, and then we go down to compare means, and within compare means we see the one-way ANOVA. It's pretty easy to set up. Uh, so our numeric variable goes into the dependent variable box. And so you'll see there I have log of the violent crime rate already there. Uh, factor is SPSSEs for categorical variable. So we put region in there. Uh, you remember that in uh, the independent samples t-test, one had to specify the groups uh, in addition to uh, sliding the variable into the factor box. You don't have to do that in the one-way ANOVA. It automatically assumes everything there is uh, a category. And down below, I have uh, checked the estimate effect size for overall text test box. Uh, so that's a new feature that we now have uh, in SPSS. If you're looking at a, a version before SPSS 27, you might not have that. Um, and then notice the options up there on the right. Uh, as we go through this presentation, we're going to be using the post hoc and the options buttons. So I just want to highlight where those are located. Uh, here I'm looking at the options. Um, so I'm going to, within the options button, uh, select descriptive statistics homogeneity of variance test, the Brown-Forsyth test, and the Welch test. So let's go back to our example. Because I checked descriptive statistics, I get this really nice table that has uh, my dependent variable, the log of the violent crime rate, broken out by region. So that's where that came from. Next, I want to check the test of homogeneity of variances. And this is a Levine's test. So uh, if you uh, saw the video on independent samples t-tests, we had a Levine's test there, and we have one here. What we are checking 
for in this in, in the Levine's test is to make sure that the variances are the same or similar around each of the four regions. The number we want to look at is the first row right there. Um, that is our standard Levine's test. Uh, the way we read that test is if, if we're looking for like a 95% cutoff or 0 0.05 level of probability, if the significance value on the right is greater than 0 0.05, we assume that the variances are the same across the board categories or that they're homogeneous. If it is less than 0 0.05, then we assume that they're not homogeneous and that's going to affect what we're going to do. Uh, in terms of the null hypothesis with that break, because the Levine's test gets uh, confusing, people read it backwards sometimes. The null hypothesis is that the, variers, the variances are similar. So now we'll look at the goodness of fit and effect size. So let's look at the goodness of fit. And that's uh, this table right here. And, and here we need to understand the general linear model a bit. So I'll, I'll refer to some ideas, but this is where you, you need to go back and look at the video on the general linear model if you don't understand what I'm saying. Um, in statistics, we always have this benchmark. So we're taking a new measure and comparing it to an old measure. Uh, old measure in this case is the mean. So uh, let's say I take the state of Ohio and, I, and you ask me, what is the crime rate for the state of Ohio? And I would predict the crime rate for the state of Ohio based on the national mean. Uh, so that's what we have in what we call the total sum of squares. We take every state in the country and we subtract it from the national mean. We square that and so we get a distance. Uh, so that number 7.368 is the sum of all of those distances across the 50 states. That 7.368 has no intrinsic meaning. That's measured in scales in, in terms of the scale used for the um, variable that we're looking at. Um, if, if the scale uses large numbers, that could be a large number. If it uses very small numbers, it would be a very small number. Now, you'll notice I said 50 states, but when we look at the degrees of freedom, it says only 49. Uh, and that's because we subtract one because of the mean. So we already have this estimate out there. Uh, from the mean, and we have to account for the, the fact that we're using up this piece of information. So we only have 49 uh, free pieces of information left to use. What we're looking for with the one-way ANOVA is, is whether the group mean substantially improves our prediction that we would get from the national mean. So we have four uh, group means. So for each state, we will subtract the distance uh, of the state's group mean from the national mean, and we'll square that distance. So in the case of Ohio, Ohio's in the Midwest, so we're going to subtract uh, the difference of the Midwest from the national mean, and we're going to credit that to Ohio. Uh, we're also going to give the same value to Indiana, which is also in the Midwest, because they, they're both using the same group mean. So we'll do that for all the 50 states. Um, you'll notice there that degrees, the, the degrees of freedom is three instead of four. And that's where that uh, one that we took away in the total, that's where we're accounting for that. Because you'll notice that the three um, and the 46 below that total 49. So we're accounting for that minus one with the between groups degrees of freedom. The within groups category is everything left over. So we can think of that as a residual or error sum of squares. So uh, if you want to do the math on that, you could just subtract whatever's left uh, from the total sum of squares. Or you can also uh, add things up. So that would be the distance between Ohio and the Midwest group mean, uh, as I'm working out this example. Now over on the far right, we have the statistical significance. So what that's telling us is the statistical significance of this overall model. The null hypothesis is that I can regard uh, all four region means as the same, assuming uh, whatever my confidence interval is. So the way we get that is to use the F statistic. 
the F is the ratio of the mean square columns. So the 4.75 that we see with between groups is 1.426, the sum of squares, divided by three. And then for the within groups, the 1.29 is the 5.942 divided by 46. Now it turns out the ratio of between groups and within groups is for uh, mathematicians and statisticians, this known relationship out that, that's out there, and that's known as the F statistic. Here I have a picture of the cumulative distribution function for F. You don't really need to, you need to know this as background. You don't really have to calculate it because obviously you saw that the, the printout does this. And, and you'll notice that for each combination of degrees of freedom, uh, so uh, in our case, we have a F with a, a, th a three and 46 degree of freedom combination. You'll notice that that line is different. Uh, so this is similar to what we saw with chi-square where with each degree of freedom, that distribution shape changes some. So we have a, in this model an F of 3.679 with three and 46 degrees of freedom. And the significance level there is 0 0.019. Now that's less than 0 0.05, which means we're going to reject the null hypothesis that the means are going to be equal across all four regions and accept the alternative hypothesis that they are different. Now the uh, test that we just used assumes that um, and is the most common way to look at that table assumes that we have homogeneous variances across our means. What happens with the Levine's test if it turns out that uh, we conclude that the means are not homogeneous, we can take another number that has an adjustment in it. And that's the Welch number here. So Welch, the, the F value would be revised downward to 3.280, uh, but you go up to the far right and you'll see we also still have a statistically significant relationship, 0 0.039. Not as significant as before, but still significant. So this will have a big effect if we're, we're right close to that 0 0.05 threshold. I included the Brown Forsyth uh, statistic uh, simply because it's interesting. Um, I, I don't recommend using it, but uh, as you might recall, when we look at the uh, descriptive statistics, we say sometimes the median is actually a better measure of central tendency uh, than the mean. Uh, most of our advanced statistics are actually built around comparison to means. Uh, and there's a good reason for that uh, back in the old days before we had all this computing power. Uh, it was very hard to do calculations off the median. The median was a memory intensive statistic. Uh, so people didn't do a lot with them, but now they're starting to play with medians more to see if we can get better predictions. So the Brown Forsyth statistic is what happens if we use the median rather than the mean is the point of comparison. I don't recommend that you use this, but I'm just uh, introducing it uh, to say, I think that we're gonna see some movement that way over the next decade or two in statistics. So we have you prepared, not just for this week's assignment, but hopefully as things, um, as we get more options down the road, you'll be, you'll be able to shift over. Now let's look at the other table that I had with the goodness of fit, and that's the, uh, ANOVA effect sizes, uh, you'll notice that there's four statistics placed there. Uh, the, the preference right now overwhelmingly is to use the eta squared. Under the point estimate, the eta squared is where the eta squared is, and so that's 0.194. So this one way ANOVA has an eta squared of 0.194. And we also get the 95% confidence interval. Uh, with effect sizes, we don't always use uh, in every statistic the p-value. Um, I, I, when we talk about the statistical significance of the fit of the ANOVA, we go to the F-ratio. But we can also report the effect size alongside that uh, without using um, the uh, statistical significance for the effect size. But it is good to just double check uh, on the 95% confidence interval to make sure that zero does not fall into uh, the range. Otherwise we have a complication. 
here's how we interpret the eta squared. Uh, you usually, you, or I won't say usually, but you often see eta squared the way I have it written here in the header. Uh, it's that thing that looks like the Greek letter N. I don't know how we get from eta to N, uh, but that's that's what it is. Um, and if you don't know how to do Greek letters in uh, Microsoft Word, uh, they're in the symbol font. So if you go to the character map, uh, you will you can find the uh, eta uh, and paste it in there, and then put the square next to it. Uh, here uh, are from Jacob Cohen, who is the king of effect sizes. Uh, this is how he interprets the eta square: 0 0.0196 for a, a small the threshold for a small effect. The threshold for medium is 0.13, and the threshold for large is 0.26. Now you're going to go, oh, Professor Rogers, this is this is getting confusing because you gave me one rule, set of rules for the t-test with Cohen's d, and another set for the Pearson's r, and now I have this set for the eta squared. Okay, as it turns out, uh, we won't look at that in this class, but when we get to OLS regression, we're going to start seeing how the Pearson's r is related to the general linear model. All I'm going to say right now is that if you take the square root of the values that I have here, you're going to get something fairly similar to the effect sizes for the Pearson's R. So there the breaks were 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and 0 0.5. Now these square roots don't come out quite the same, uh, but they come out really close. And that is not a coincidence. Uh, that, that is because uh, with the underlying math, the Pearson's R and the eta squared are actually related. Uh, so now when we look at our eta squared with the 0.194 and the test we used on the previous page, uh, what we see is we have a medium sized effect. Now that 0.194 is also the percent of the total sum of squares explained. It's 19.4% of the total sum of squares. And how do we know that? Well, if we go up above to our goodness of fit table, 1.426 are between groups sum of squares divided by our total sum of squares, 7.368 equals 0.194. So uh, we have a 19.4% improvement in the model because we used uh, the regional means is our predictor for a state's violent crime, right? Rather than using the national mean. We established that that difference was statistically significant. We did that with the F ratio. And we established that it was a medium sized effect. We did that with the uh, eta squared. Now, the so far we don't know where uh, this difference in means is coming from. It, it's a comment about the whole model. So we want to pinpoint that. And uh, there is a test. It's the post hoc test. So it was one of the buttons that we showed you back when we looked at the dialog box uh, for the one-way ANOVA. And, and this is what you see. You see all of these tests, te tests, and you have to figure out which one you have to use. It, it's actually not as hard as you think. So we have a dividing line here between the equal variance is assumed and the equal variance is not assumed. Uh, in this case, we ended up assuming equal variances. When we have equal variances, the most common test is the Bonferroni test. So what I would tell you is stick with Bonferroni unless you learn some other reason to go a different way. So we're not in this class going to get into all of the technical uh, things about uh, the Bonferroni test. Uh, the best I have ever done is sometimes run uh, four or five tests just to see if I end up with a different result. But but by far, uh, most people are using Bonferroni. Now, if we had unequal variances, uh, the test that uh, is recommended that you use is the Games Howell. Here's the comparison plot for this analysis. So this is assuming uh, equal variances. And so we get each combination of regions. So we have Northeast compared to Midwest, Southwest, Midwest compared to Northeast, Southwest, and so on. The two columns that uh, we want to pay most attention to are the mean difference and the statistical significance. 
The statistical significance is going to change based on the type of model that we selected uh, under the post hoc uh, dialog box. What we learn in this analysis is that there, uh, the difference that's coming out is between two regions. Uh, so what we're seeing is that it's the Northeast and the South that have the only statistically significant difference when we do region by region comparisons. Now we see it twice in the table because you know we took Northeast and within Northeast we have South as one of the regions and then within South we have Northeast as one of the regions. So we, we see it twice. It's not that there's two different uh, uh, mean, it's not that there's two different uh, relationships that are different. It's the same relationship expressed uh, differently in, in our table. So that's what's causing uh, this model to be statistically significant, this difference between the Northeast and the South. Here's the syntax. So if you did all of this work and you wanted to keep your one-way ANOVA because you might want to run it again, this is what's uh, at the top uh, on all of that output that you get with your uh, analysis. This is what's there. So you can actually copy it off the output page. You just highlight it and copy it like you would copy any text. Uh, and you could paste it into a syntax file, uh, which is a different window in SPSS. Uh, and then you could save this and run it again in the future. Let's look at some issues related to the one-way ANOVA. So first, some possible uses. Uh, you definitely use it with a categorical variable with three or more categories. Um, and um, that's the this is the only option we're going to give you unless both are categorical, in which case you would go to the chi-square. But if one was categorical and uh, one was numeric and it was three or more categories, this is the way you would go. Uh, you can use it with two or more categories. There's a debate. I, I've got to say I haven't got sat down and gone through that debate. But the current wisdom that I have is that you can use it with two categories. Um, so there, the people who do that say that when we go to the underlying dynamics of how these models work, that the underlying dynamics of a t-test are close enough to the under dyna underlying dynamics of the one-way ANOVA that, that we can do that. Um, this is also a really neat test if I have a lot of categories, too many categories, and I want to reduce them. When we have lots of categories in a model, that reduces our degrees of freedom, which makes it hard to achieve statistical significance, and it also makes it harder to do the analysis because I have more categories that I have to talk about and present. Um, so sometimes if I have a lot of regions that uh, do not have statistically significant differences across them, I might want to collapse categories. And the one-way ANOVA with that comparison plot gives me some guidance as to what to do. It's not definitive, uh, but it will, it will give me something to look at so that I'm not just guessing categories, but that I'm making something sensible. Now, I, I will add here that I recently used a one-way ANOVA to help me with this. So I am, uh, with our study of conspiracy theories, uh, we were looking at various news sources uh, that people use by religious groups. Uh, and we had, had 11 religious groups, which made a ridiculously complicated model. Um, and we noticed that several of the religious groups did not have statistically significant relationships. So I, I ended up going to a one-way ANOVA and using the Bonferroni test to determine whether or not I should collapse categories. And I, and I did. So what I saw happening with the Bonferroni test was very similar to what we saw happening within the full model with those variables that were not significant. So we ended up collapsing categories because of that. Now, there are some controversies here. Uh, and and there, one is with the test of homogeneity. But not everyone agrees with that test. Mentioned with the independent samples t-test that there's some controversy over that. And, and it gets even more controversial here uh, because there is the possibility that the variances might be the same across three of the regions and not the fourth. Uh, in, in which case that you might be 
you, you probably should be in the comparison plots doing different tests to look at different regions. Well, our, it, the output really isn't set up to, to look at that. And so there's some questions that we might be making some bad decisions uh, using the test for homogeneity. So you will encounter some people who refuse to use it. I'm teaching you how to use it. Um, I'm finding it useful because of the third bullet point above. Uh, but even then, uh, my judgment is subjective. So I want you to have that option in case you want to go that way. Uh, the other thing that comes up is a discussion about whether or not it can be used with binary dependent variables. Um, and uh, technically, the answer is no. The general linear model is made for um, a uh, numeric dependent variable. However, with the one-way ANOVA, the way it's constructed, um, if it stays within, if, you're, if your 0, 1 predicted value stays within the 0, 1 range, which it was possible, some people might say it's OK. Um, I, I have done it. I don't report that as an official result, but I have done that in some exploratory numbers to get through something really fast. Uh, the alternative is to use uh, a cross tabs and a chi square. If you're in that situation where you're trying to do something uh, like that, uh, it might be better rather than using a one way ANOVA that you'd be using your cross tabs and using the chi square and the various uh, measures of association that go with that. So, this is our presentation. Again, um, I'm a little more informal than I am in some of the videos, but I do think we hit all the right information. Uh, so thank you for your patience as we go through this. And that's it for today. Thank you.